I hate chemistry time. That's not actually the title. No, uh, chemistry time. That's not what we say. What do we say? Chemistry time. Chemistry. Oh, we got chemistry two time with the oxidation state in between. There we go. Chemistry two time. Um, today we're talking about. Let's let's label this intermolecular forces. Your book titles this states of matter, uh, but the main thing we're going to talk about is intermolecular forces, and that sounds cooler. We are actually talking about all the states of matter, but we're talking about them as they relate to the intermolecular forces. <coughs> First, you know how you know how we like to do around here, around these parts. Let's break this phrase down. Let's, what does what is intermolecular? I mean, to what does intermolecular probably refer? Into. Inter. What's the prefix inter mean? And in. Okay. Could you be more specific? Inside. What other what other words have inter in them? I think a lot of biology ones, yeah. some daily usage ones. Interactions. Have, oh, there we go. That's a good one. Uh, interactions is actions. What something? It's a, it's With a preposition. Someone. Yes. Or. Between. Yes. Between. So inter meaning between. What other what other words that we commonly start with inter? The inter. Net. The internet is a is the inter or the the between of two nets, two computers. Um, you know, you're in the 90s, uh, the internet when it was first being, I don't know, kind of not necessarily invented, it was invented before that, I think, but the internet when it was expanding to involve all computers was described as a web. You know about the web? Uh, because it would be different computers all over the world that were attached to every other computer. And so each of these things would be attached to all the others and it would end up looking like a nasty little cobweb. Um, the internet, right? The internet. In, in between the different networks, right? What other? The, the inter... We're going to have to cut, cut, cut all of this. <laughs> what the... Okay, next next example. The inter... The inter... That was the only word I can think of. Yeah. No, let's think of another one. The inter... Net. We already inter have that. Interweb. Okay, which is just like a colloquial term for the internet. Inter... <coughs> The I'm driving on the interstate, interstate which goes both ways. both ways. I sent you my. It goes email. interdependent. Between. Yes, it goes between the states. Places. It goes between the states. A molecular, a molecular referring to what? Molecule. Molecules. Molecules, but also def de this is used kind of loosely to just mean particles in this case. Intermolecular so sounds, I think, probably just sounds better, or more accurately, they had used, they being scientists, had used the word intermolecular uh, so long enough before we just started differentiating between molecules that we get. We're going to learn about the electromagnetic force. It, this is all having to do with the electromagnetic force, yes. And then forces, as you say, these are obviously pushes or pulls acting on objects. In this case, they're all uh, electromagnetic. Which you bring up a good point because that is as opposed to like an R. inter electromagnetic. That should be an E. E electromagnetic. Um, this is as opposed to, we're going to define this too. Um, I was also thinking of intercellular. The intercellular space is the space between cells. cells. And that was as, as opposed to in uh, biology to the intracellular, which is inside of a cell, or wow. intramolecular forces in this case are the forces within a molecule. Within. Intra. Yeah. Intra, within, inter, between. So intramolecular are, would be within particles. In this case, uh, within molecules. So these, this is the bonding, <coughs> bonding, holding a molecule, once again in quotes. So that wants to talk together. We're, well, we're, that's what we're talking about today. So this is the bonding. So these are where there are three that the we commonly use. The electromagnetic. Yes, and it governs all of this. But the three common. You said we were talking about that one with bits. We are. Yeah, but I'm, we're, let's talk about the intramolecular because we've done that before. What are the intramolecular bonds? Electromagnetic. No, that's they're Draw. all. Electro. No. What? What? What the kind of bonds? Particles. No. What kind of bonds are there? Oh, covalent. There that's what I said. Between covalent. Yeah, I thought you did. Covalent, oh. ionic. And metallic. Remember that covalent is also oh, called those kind of molecular. Bonds. Yeah, these are the intramolecular bonds. So we never called them that when we were talking about them last year, or for you guys two years ago. But that is that is what they're called. These are what hold a molecule together itself. So we think about this. You know him. 
supposed to be water. And oh, these, Mouse. these, these are the intramolecular forces, and these are covalent <coughs> bonds, in this case, covalent bonds. But then, so what, just as Dolly says, what would be the intermolecular forces? What would that imply? So these ones hold the molecule together. What would the intermolecular forces do? The reaction between? No, that's a good guess, though. Pushing them apart? No. That's literally between them. Yeah, these, these, are, these are within the molecule. But we're not talking about the atoms. It is between them. atoms, but we're talking about this is within the molecule. So this would be between different... So what is that? Those mean? are between two particles. Yeah, two molecules. So in this case, the, the force holding together one water to the next, because what you what the roadblock you're having here is that we're used to, at least up in this up until this point in chemistry, talking about what's going on inside of here. But now we're talking about how this interacts with other ones like it. So when we have this, so this you're saying water, that water, water reacting with water. Not reacting with, but being in the same place as we almost never in real life deal with one water molecule all by itself. It's almost always a mess of water molecules that we're worried about. What gives water, that water, most of its properties are this, the way that the molecules interact with each other. Mm -hmm. Do you have something of this written down? So Love this that. one, so this one is what we had dealt with in chapter seven. Mm -hmm. From the way back when. No, that period should be there. Chapter seven. And then this one is what we're dealing with today. So these are the forces that hold one molecule to another. This one looks like a germstick. Oh, great. Um, I think this looks really nice, actually. Uh, anyway, so we're dealing with the forces that hold separate sets of molecules together. The first thing we're going to talk about is how these forces apply to the different states of matter. So we're going to have a table of state of matter. And we're going to have uh, another column of that table, state of matter. Um, telling us the relative strength of intermolecular force. You can probably guess this already. Yeah. So which one is going to have the least intermolecular force between them? Yeah. yeah, of the three classic ones, it's going to be gas. So gas has the least strongest intermolecular force. We're not going to include plasma because do you remember how plasma, by definition, what happens to plasma? What process occurs that causes plasma to exist? It is combustion. Yeah, it, it separates the electrons from the for the nucleus, and so even not only just the intramolecular, but the in, intraatomic forces, the the electromagnetic force that causes the electrons to circle the nucleus, that is overcome, and so it doesn't really apply to plasma. But in gases. This has the least, or sometimes none. We, in fact, we like to consider that it has no intermolecular force. This, this is what we call an ideal gas. In real life, in real life, as we're so well aware, not just in our community, but in the state, in the nation, in the world, there is so little that is ideal. Very little actually is exactly how we plan or want it to be. Nothing's ideal. But when, we, when it has no intermolecular force, we call that the ideal. And even though it's true that this never happens, we still we still pretend it does because it makes the math a lot easier. And we'll talk about stupid. that a little more. Uh, it's, it's more or less stupid. Um, but no, it's, it's actually more or less true. It, it, it comes out pretty much right no matter what. But anyway, so then obviously if the gas has the least or no uh, intramolecular, here, then liquid would have, I don't know, let's just put some or medium, sure, and then the solid would have the most. And this is for a given state of, or for a given substance. It's totally possible for the actual magnitude of, uh, of one substance's solids to have a stronger intramolecular, or sorry, a weaker intramolecular attraction than another substance's liquid if we're measuring them by like strength of the actual forces. But for one substance, this is true. That substance as a gas would have the lowest amount of intramolecular forces, and that substance as a solid would have the strongest intramolecular forces. There are some specific examples, and we're going to talk about why these things even exist at all, and it does all have to do, are you listening to me? It does all have to do with the electromagnetic force. So there's this thing, let's, let's move on. There's a, you did your vocab already, right? Yeah. 
So what is a dispersion force? We sometimes call these the London, not after London Gillum, the London dispersion force. What's a dispersion force? Can you check our vocab? Mm -hmm, I do. What's a dispersion force? Weak forces that result from temporary shifts in the density of electrons and What do you reckon is the key adjective in that? Electrons. That's not an adjective. Um, I mean, um, density. No, shift. That's a verb. That's a noun. No, that I don't know. What's Wait, the key what? adjective in Electrons. that? Electrons. Density. That's a noun. Shifts. Wait. That's a verb. Yeah, I use weak. That. Temporary. Weak or temporary, yeah. Both weak and temporary. They're, in fact, they're weak. They're the same. internal molecular forces are weak because they're temporary. So any molecule, um, let's think about just a hydrogen molecule. It's just H2. Two H's bonded together. By BT dub, what's this intramolecular force here? What kind of intramolecular force is it? It's covalent. So just by the way, this is a covalent bond. So we just have some hydrogens hanging out with each other. You know, just because what we're realizing now that these things don't exist just one molecule in a vacuum. They're all bouncing around. And the electrons which are around these things, how many electrons does each hydrogen bring with it to the table? One. Just one. The electrons are in these things just because they're randomly, remember, they, they basically teleport the electrons. But since they're randomly flashing in and out of existence, because it's bonded together, they're flashing in and out of existence around both of them. It's perfectly reasonable to think that once in a while, the electrons might both be on one side of this hydrogen. And for that moment, or you know, that, that millisecond, not even a millisecond, that microsecond that this occurs, which side of this molecule has a, has a charge? <coughs> be careful. The opposite one. Which side has a charge? If both electrons are over here. It's a trick question, is a hint. But there's no they're, there. But they're both charged. They're both charged. This one is charged how if both electrons are here? Negatively. This one's negative, and this no, one is positive. positive. Just for a split second. And then if this one happens to be the other way, and the electrons are both there, what, has, what charge is this? Negative. Negative, and this side is? Positive. positive. That's the same way as before. <laughs> but now, this one with its negative charge over yonder, and its positive charge over yonder, and this one with the opposite direction, they're, they're momentarily attracted That's to each other. Direction, they're the same way. No, but the negative is, and positive are next to each other. Right, that's right. So they're attracting each other for just a split second. And this is called a dispersion force. This is the weakest because it is temporary. Okay, explain that again. So just just by a twist of fate, and you know it's not really that twisted because there's only two electrons in this case, but just by a twist of fate, these happen to have the both electrons yeah. Or more electrons, I should say. More electrons are on one side than the other, so for a split second, it has a partial charge. Yeah. Partially negative and partially positive. And since that same thing could happen to this one, now the partial negative end of this one would be attracted to the partial positive of this one and the, and the other way around. And so for just a split second, these two molecules happen to be attracted due to random temporary fluctuations. And so there's a weak bond between them. Well, the bond doesn't have to be weak, but on average, the bond among all of these are weak because it, it happens randomly. Okay. And that's called a dispersion force. The book, I'm going to quote this, it says, Remember that the electrons in an electron cloud are in constant motion. When two molecules are in close contact, especially when they collide, the electron cloud of one molecule repels the electron cloud of the other molecule. The electron density around each nucleus is, for a moment, greater in one region of each cloud. Each molecule forms a temporary, what we call a dipole. This is called a temporary, temporary meaning, Temporary, I mean. Temporary, not always going to be. Yeah, not always. They're not the opposite of permanent. Nothing's permanent. But this means that it doesn't last for very long. So temporary, and then we use this word dipole. Break down the word dipole real quick. What's, what's di? Two. Two. And pole means it has two poles. Two, one, one pole is negative and one pole is positive. As opposed to no no polarity, no Does charge. That weakest, weakest because it is temporary. Now, write this down, underline it. The very next paragraph in your book says, dispersion forces exist between all particles. So everything, literally everything, exhibits dispersion forces because it's based on random chance, where the electrons happen to be. All particles. Everything, at least temporarily, exhibits dispersion forces. 
Some things we don't worry about it because they have other intramolecular forces that become more important. But everything exhibits dispersion forces. So then, why did what? Why did? Why do you think what's his bucket chose hydrogen for this example? Because it was the easiest. Okay, it is easy. It's easy to draw. I've only got one electron. But what's what's true about this particular molecule? It's covalent, but not only is it, it's a special kind of covalent, where it's what we call... Diatomic molecule. It's, it's diatomic. They're the same atom, and so there's no permanent difference in charge. Yeah. That's why we used it for this kind, because this one would have no permanent difference in charge. It doesn't have a permanent dipole. So the next kind, I'm just going to use the same box, the next kind is called dipole-dipole. Dipole... Dipole. Hazel will remember this from last year. We used to, when we talked about this last year, he, they, Tyler, Natalie, and Hazel, all them, called it dipple dipple. And I thought that was kind of funny and cute. But uh, anyway, dipole dipole was what happens if, instead of it being a temporary fluctuation, if they always have a permanent dipole. So this one exists in molecules with a permanent dipole, such as. What? What causes a permanent dipole? They must be, instead of, unlike hydrogen, they must be what? Bonded. They don't have to be ionically bonded, but there has to be a difference in their electronegativity okay. for one reason or another. They could be ionically so bonded. So what's a dipole? Um, the, di the dipole just means it has a, a charge. And so, for instance, we could draw uh, hydrogen chloride. So there's a permanent difference in the number of electrons. This one has a partial positive and this one has a partial negative because the electrons like to hang out with him more because he's got more protons. Just like you guys like to hang out with the dude with the most Adidas more. I assume. With a what? The most Adidas. Permanent dipole. Why does this become partial positive? Who do the, uh, imagine, put your, head in the, put your mind in the head of the electron. Who's the electron going to want to hang out with more? He? Who's only got one Adidas, or he who's got 400 Adidas? 400. Well, Adidas here is a metaphor for what? The number of? Electrons. No. The, the, you are the electron. You're attracted yeah, to so it's protons. protons. The chlorine's got, in fact, in this case, it happens to be, what, 19? No, 17. The chlorine's got 17 protons. The hydrogen's got one. You're an electron. You want to hang out with him more, right? So that ends up being net partial negative because electrons have a negative charge. Electrons like to hang out with this more. So this has a permanent dipole. It's the same way, it works with the same fundamental method that the dispersion forces work, except for this one, instead of having randomly a dipole, this one's always got a dipole. So this end of this one always attracts the next end of the next one, oops, et cetera, right? So they end up not necessarily lining up, but they get attracted in this way, yeah? So similar thing, except for this one, it's a permanent dipole. Can the last one, is a, is a special case of this, which is, are you good on this one? Mm -hmm. So the last one is a special case of the dipole-dipole called a hydrogen bond. I shouldn't have used that last one as an example because it actually exhibits this hydrogen bond. Um, but the hydrogen bond is a special case, strong, we'll just call it a stronger dipole-dipole interaction occurring when H bonds with, and it has, there's a list of specific ones, fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. Fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So that last example, well actually that wasn't because that was chlorine, but because it occurs with when hydrogen bonds with fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. And that's because these ones have an even larger difference um, than the, example, or the other example. So all of these, in fact, you've probably heard at one point in your life that the water has a higher boiling point and a lower freezing point than other similar liquids, and it does, and that's because it has this hydrogen bond, because water, as you know, is hydrogen and oxygen, isn't it? 
So it exhibits this hydrogen bond, and that causes the water, the bonding in the water is stronger than it would be if this didn't exist. So a similar thing, hydrogen chloride, which is a gas at room temperature, is a gas because it has, just like we were talking about before, water would be in this category. The hydrogen chloride would be a gas because it doesn't exhibit the bond. It has, it has weaker bonds than the water does at the same temperature. Okay. What does that imply about things that are solid at room temperature? They must have what kind of bonds? Stronger, Stronger bonds at room temperature. Um, if, you ha if you're familiar with the vocabulary, okay, I'm looking specifically at things like viscosity, surface tension, crystalline solid, amorphous solid. If you're familiar with those things, that will be fine for the section on solids and liquids. Um, and then the last thing that your book talks about, we're going to talk about one other thing. Uh, after this, but the last thing your book talks about that I want to talk, talk to you about is this next idea about phase changes and phase diagrams. Your book has a whole section on gases that I want you to read through, but we'll talk more about that when we deal with the gas laws in the next chapter. We're going to talk about a couple of things after this, like I said, but for the most part, the things about gases we'll talk about in the next lesson. First, we're going to talk about phase changes, and this should be reviewed not only from when you were in chemistry, but when you were in physical science. Uh, what color should we use? Red. Red. Pink. Red. Red. Yeah. Crusty. Musty. Oh, that's really crusty. Chocolate. Okay. We'll call it chocolate. I would not call that chocolate. <coughs> we're going to use wheat bread. Um, we're talking about phase changes real quick here. It's a beautiful color. Phase changes. It's not even really wheat. I call it rust. This is the color of rust. Well, burnt orange. Remind me, what, are, oh, right? Shh, what, are, what are the four states of matter that we commonly talk about? Evaporation. Gravity. Solids. Okay, liquid. Oh, solids, liquid, and gases. Liquids. Gas and vapor. Gases. Now, in a different non-rust color, blue, I'm going to draw the, the line between these that we, that we the oh, verb we use to describe when one changes. What's a solid turning into a liquid called? Melting. What's a liquid turning into a gas called? Evaporation. Yeah, or we're going to call it vaporization because evaporation specifically implies that it does so through uh, what's called uh, vapor pressure, whereas boiling would be if it reaches a certain temperature, but vaporization covers both. And then gases to plasma. Do you remember? Um, ions. No. Ionization. Ionization. Because it does make them in ions. It removes the electrons from the nuclei, making them in ions. From, then in another color I'm going to do, uh, from plasma to gas, what do we call that then, you reckon? Deionization. Oh, well, yeah, that was an I. <laughs> it is. No. Gases to liquids? No, I never like gases to liquids. And then liquids to solids. No. Well, maybe colloquially, but we have a better word for that. We used it when we talked about the wasp. You know, oh, the freezing. Freezing. And then there are some more, um, I don't know, kind of special cases. If it goes right from a solid to a gas without becoming a liquid first, oh, yeah. that one's called sublimation. And then the other way around is called deposition. You need to be aware of these verbs. Um, they're not necessarily, some of them are vocab words, but they're not necessarily all vocab words. And then you should be aware of this uh, idea of a phase diagram. A phase diagram involves two things. Temperature, usually on the x-axis, temperature on the x-axis, and pressure on the y-axis. And it'll have some curve for it. Each substance has its own, each substance has its own uh, phase diagram. What, just looking at this diagram, which I just changed because I wanted to match the book a little bit better, what do you think would be in this category here? Or in this area here? Do what? 
What do you think would be in this category, or in this area here, where we have relative, well, really any range of temperatures, but low pressure? What do you think is in that? Temperature? Yeah, well, what, what state of matter? What are these states okay. of matter? Okay, explain it out to me. This is a, this is a chart. We have what temperature on the x-axis yeah. and pressure on the y-axis. Yeah. This is obviously this is going up in pressure, yeah. this is going up in temperature. What is what state of matter of the three classic states of when matter? When temperatures low. When we have low temperatures and low pressure. And low pressures. Gas. Or yeah, gas. Gas. And the key is that as the temperature goes up, we don't need that that much even at high pressures, there can still be a gas. Okay? So which one would be here then? When we go I think of, yeah, this, this must be a solid because then if the temperature increases, then we have a liquid. liquid. So if our, if our, if we're at, let's say we're at this pressure and this temperature, we can say it's going to be a solid. But if we decrease the pressure on it, what's going to happen? Will it become a liquid first? No. Nope, because we can tell because we just go right down this line. If we're at this pressure and this temperature, it's a liquid, mm -hmm. and if we increase the temp, or sorry, if we increase the temperature, it's going to become a gas. If we decrease the temperature, it'll become a solid. And if we, let's say we both, we increase the temperature and the pressure both at the same rate, it'll become a gas. Do you see what I'm? Do you see how we do that? This is called a phase diagram. There's a special little spot right here. You see a special little spot? What's special about that? Plasma. Mm -hmm. Right here. Special spot. Oh, it's I made it too big now. Oh, yeah, it's where it can exist at all three Yeah, states. and that's called a triple point. Not every substance has a triple point, but some do. Water does, and that's called the triple point. And there's also somewhere up here there will be a critical point where it's always going to be a gas. Always gas increasing pressure will not cause condensation. So anywhere above this point, this uh, this combination of temperature and pressure, even if we increase the pressure, which would normally cause a gas to turn to a liquid, it won't cause that anymore. That's called the critical point. And phase diagrams, look, there's three examples in your book in the chapter of phase diagrams. They have one of water, one of carbon dioxide, and one for carbon. The, no, the interesting thing about the one for carbon is that it, it has both, instead of the category solid, it has diamond and graphite on there. And the very last thing we need to talk about, unless you have questions about this. Nope. There are, there are um, two mathematical, I don't know, ideas that we deal with in this chapter. We're going to write them both down. They both relate to gases. So we're going we're gonna, to, and in my opinion, the reason I talk about them is because it's in your book in this chapter. But in my opinion, these would both be better off in chapter 13, which is about the gas laws. But these are, uh, we'll just call them gas-related Mathematic principles. And they are Dalton's law, which is also sometimes called Dalton's law of partial pressures. And, this, and the next one is called Graham's law, which is also sometimes called Graham's law of effusion and diffusion. They're both quite simple mathematically. Dalton's law is super simple. Um, we'll do that one first. Dalton's law of partial pressures is just that the sum of the pressures, the total pressure of a container, is equal to pressure 1 plus pressure 2 plus pressure 3, etc. Literally, you just add up the pressures, the and that gives you the pressure. total pressure. Yeah. It does seem facile when you describe it that way. But it is important, and it, it's easy to see how it could be a little bit more complicated, or people might try to overcomplicate it, but that's all it is. And then Graham's law relates the rate of effusion is proportional to 
1 over the square root of molar mass of that substance. And then specifically, the rate of substance A as it compares to the rate of substance B, I'm sorry, the rate of substance B is equal to the square root of the rate of substance B over the rate of substance A. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry, molar mass of B over molar mass of A. What does that say, the rate of infusion what? Um, is proportional to that little, oh, okay. that little proportional symbol. And now hold up, right before we finish, what do you notice is different about, or what's, what's the primary difference in the way these are laid out? What do you notice about the second one for rate of diffusion? I know both things. Yeah, under a square root, so it's related rates to. Of two things. Yep, it's the rate of one thing compared to another, but look. Here it's, it's rate of A over B compared to molar mass of B over A. So what kind of proportionality does that imply? Indirect. Other, the other word, you always say that, but you don't mean it. Do I? No. Oh, in proportion. Inversely proportional. Oh. You're right. <laughs> inversely proportional. So the molar mass is inversely proportional to the square root. Or sorry, the rate of diffusion is inversely proportional to the square root. You have a lot of other readings. This is literally, I would say that this is, this is the skeleton of the chapter, but you have to read it to fill out the guts and the muscles and the hair and the eyeballs and stuff. You need to read more in order to learn more about all this stuff, but this will get you started.